the story is part of a larger being that, it, that includes uh, many levels, including the, uh, a feeling level. Because so someone might have a very paranoid story of the world uh, or a very judgmental story of the world and other people, but then they have a healing experience, they have an experience of safety and beliefs about the world that had seemed so logical and compelling before, now they no longer seem that way and new beliefs mm -hmm. are available. So, so yeah, um, the story can be almost a symptom of something deeper, but I, it also can be a cause. I don't think we can separate, especially on a collective level. Uh, the way that we interpret events is part of how we, we make our personal and collective choices. So really though, it's, it's not so much, okay, I'm going to impose a new story on the world and simply it's, it's intellectual uh, coherency and beauty is going to make everybody change their mind. No, it's part of a bigger change. It's, it's speaking to a readiness for that story. And the readiness comes through all kinds of processes, all kinds of healing processes. And, and it, but it's also a landmark moment. It's not uh, just a symptom. It's also a, um, a choice too. Like at some point we come to a, a readiness. Am I ready to step into the state of being of which that story is a part? The story itself can be a, tra can be a trauma. You know, right. the things that tell us about ourselves, especially if it's coming from an authority figure, like the, a parent or a parentalized figure, like that can be traumatic. Mm -hmm. You know, the story, when it's, and especially when it's backed up with emotion and backed up with power, yeah. like the story is important too. <laughs> Yeah. Mm, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Like, I lo yeah, lovely. Like when we see it as a whole, as a, as a whole, physical, emotional, mental uh, experience of ourselves and the world. And so, when you spoke, you also speak about the normalized trauma. Can you can you say a few words? What do you mean? Yeah. There there are some experiences that we would all agree are traumatic. Uh, experiences of, of, of abuse, for example, or um, abandonment. Uh, well, abuse and abandonment have a more muted form or a more dilute form that is so ubiquitous in our society that we take it as normal. We take trauma as normal. Uh, I would include in that birth trauma, uh, not only the biological trauma, which, I mean, trauma is not necessarily a bad thing. It's one of the ways that, that a, an organism grows. Um, but, but so in addition to the normal biological trauma of birth, there's also the trauma of, of, in many cases, being taken away from your mother and put in isolation under bright lights, or the trauma of, if you're a man, being mutilated on the most sensitive part of your body without anesthesia, which is how it used to be done. Um, the trauma of not being held all the time when your nervous system needs that. And then when you get older, there's the trauma of being, being taken out of your familiar environment and cast among a bunch of strangers when you're four or five years old or three or two years old. And then getting moved again and again from one daycare center to another where the bonds that you have begun to make and the familiarity gets cut, gets severed, and here's a new one and a new one and a new one. Uh, the trauma of being shamed and yelled at by the person who you are biologically programmed to trust the most and to see as the universe speaking to you. Like all of these things, even just the ways that we, we talk to children, um, things like, like, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself or why did you do that? or what's wrong with you? Like those kinds of outbursts are traumas. Um, even the trauma of being indoors all the time and not receiving the infinity of stimulation of many, many varieties that 
uh, a, a human is supposed to have through interactions with nature. And eventually, maybe we don't want to use the word trauma for these things. Um, it's a, a useful lens to, to help understand our, our development and, and who we are in, in this world, but it doesn't, it's not always the right lens to, to use. But a lot of the effects of these experiences are very similar to the effects of trauma. Uh, the trauma of, of our social, political, scientific, uh, intellectual authorities telling us things that on some level we know are not true. That the result of that is a cutoff, just as uh, acute trauma, acute physical trauma causes a cutoff until it's integrated and healed, it causes a cutoff from some of our feeling body. Uh, this repeated cognitive dissonance between what we're being told by authority who we're supposed to respect and what we know to be true also causes a cutoff that leaves some of our mental and emotional faculties unavailable to us mm. and disables our critical thinking and our um, independence and our sovereignty. Religious cults, uh, one way that they control their members is through uh, tra is by traumatizing them and then uh, you probably know a lot more about how that works than I do, but it creates dependency uh, and destroys one's ability to, as you were saying, self-regulate or to have full access to one's um, power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to the extent that this has happened universally in our civilization, uh, people are left very dependent mm -hmm. on so one, one way maybe that it happens is um, when we are traumatized uh, as children and then as citizens by the um, conditional approval or rejection of authority. I mean, that's tr very traumatic for a child uh, to be um, rejected by the parent. It's, it's a form of abandonment really, which is the biggest trauma probably for uh, at least any mammal uh, or a bird that's kicked out of its nest, you know, it falls out of its nest. I mean, that's the biggest trauma there is. So this isn't new information to you, but, but parents can, can control their children by invoking that trauma through punishment and praise even. So once, once someone has been living with that fear, they're, easy to control, at least for a while. Eventually they rebel against this life and death control because really that's what it is. It's a threat to your life when you're a young mammal. And, and even um, for a mature human being, we know that the, that the worst punishment in ancient times was not execution, it was ostracism. It was to be rejected by the community. So we, we have this, uh, this trauma that is, um, it starts in childhood and then it's reinforced continually. And yeah, it makes us, either we uh, knuckle under to authority, as you were saying, or we reflexively rebel and defy authority. Uh, and both responses actually make us easy to control. Then there's also um, the, the cutoff from the meeting of our human needs for identity and connection and belonging. These, the, the, the cutoff from these needs is itself traumatic. Uh, and as I was saying before with, you know, not being in nature, for example, uh, or and getting, uh, not being allowed to make lasting ties, uh, partly just because of the modern economy and, and I mean, how many people live in their extended family. Um, so that is itself traumatic and then it engenders further trauma. So this cutoff leaves us hungry for those unmet needs that we are economically, socially, and psychologically unable to meet for ourselves. Mm 
like maybe you've never had practice in forming lasting ties and, and negotiating um, complex relationships. So that hunger for connection, belonging, and identity can then get channeled onto consumerism uh, or political affiliation where that, that need to connect to, or any other addiction really, but the need to connect, the need to belong, the need for the kind of security that comes from, from safety. Like if you don't have that security, that basic experiential security, how much money do you need to actually feel safe? How, how much, uh, you know, how big of a wall or a fence do you need? How many surveillance cameras do you need? How many authorities keeping you safe do you need? Like you're going to be um, attracted to fascism and to authoritarianism and to the totalitarian parent state that is providing what you never had, what had been taken away from you. And then now it's dangled in front of you forever. So these are some of the ways that trauma makes us politically manipulable and also psychologically 